think, a bit more than an hour. I'll try to um, steal 10 minutes from the plenary reporting so that we will aim for uh, 10.30 to finish this, uh, this session. Um, we have uh, had a lot of presentations yesterday um, and I'm glad that this morning there's room for discussion, for interaction. Interaction with the audience, this is your opportunity to open up the debate. So this session is about the government policies. What are the next steps? What are the needs of governments? And uh, what are the priorities? And what has this conference so far brought to people? And what still needs to be discussed or highlighted? And um, maybe in the session we can try to identify the key messages for government to take home. Um, this session is live streamed, so I would like to ask the panelists, who I will ask to introduce themselves shortly, to, uh, if they take the floor, not look at me, because the camera is over there, so that will look very weird on, on, uh, for outsiders, uh, those following us. So uh, uh, the audience is over, over there. Um, I'm not very um, nice to watch anyway. Um, <laughs> and um, I will uh, also repeat any questions from the public so that uh, the, the questions you have and you raise are properly recorded and understood by those following us from outside. So having said that, I, uh, I propose we go around the table for a brief introduction of our uh, distinguished guests, um, highlighting uh, what uh, their uh, in business with no net loss policies and offsets uh, is, and should they have um, burning questions or themes that they really want us to discuss, this is your opportunity to highlight that, to put that on the agenda, and I will do my best to address that. Um, can I start with uh, Minister Noel Nasson? Introduce myself? Yes, please. And, uh, yes. I'm Noel Nelson Nasson, and the uh, Minister of Forest, Environment, and Protection of Natural Resources from Gabon. Uh, I think many of you have by now heard of Gabon, tiny country off the coast of Central Africa. Uh, I'm really pleased to be participating in this conference, uh, which I think raises important issues and important questions for our development strategy. Uh, I just gave a, a speech uh, outlining some of the actions that my country is uh, taking to uh, preserve uh, and fight against loss of biodiversity uh, in ways that tries to, to bring together uh, different stakeholders at the national level. We're still facing uh, important challenges in, in, in this process. And, uh, we're keen on listening to the other panelists on, on uh, experiences and suggestions and recommendations on, on how to move forward uh, for all of us. Thank you very much. John? My name is John Moffat. I'm the Director General for Legislative and Regulatory <coughs> Affairs in the Department of Environment in Canada. Uh, among other things, I'm, um, I was responsible for introducing a federal policy on conservation offsets a couple of years ago. Canada um, is, a, as you know, is a, is a large uh, resource and environment rich country uh, which has a long tradition of resource exploitation and indeed at the moment is undergoing a very intensive period of uh, resource development, uh, at least some of which is occurring in uh, some fairly environmentally significant areas. And uh, we, like, like virtually every other participant here, are, are wrestling with the challenge of uh, enabling economic development and resource development in particular, while uh, preserving uh, important and uh, environmental attributes 
and um, we certainly see offsets as a, a, an increasingly important part of the overall approach to, to that agenda. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Duga Buya, right. could I ask uh, uh, panelists to speak up a little bit so that the live streaming is really mm -hmm. catching all you're saying? Okay. Hi, Please. my name is Tulga. I'm from Mongolia. Uh, I work uh, at the Ministry of Environment and Green Development as a Vice Minister. So our, uh, in Mongolia, the, the current cabinet is established a new ministry called the Ministry of Environment and Green Development. So to uh, connect the, all the other ministers that uh, uh, conduct or collaborate with uh, environmental issues. So yesterday we talked about uh, several examples of uh, offsets or the uh, environmental issues that uh, currently are going on in the south part of the Mongolia. So uh, economic development is growing very high. On the other side, there is some impacts, several impacts to the uh, biodiversity of the uh, south region. And uh, besides that, uh, we are uh, the country that uh, Im impacted to uh, for the uh, from the uh, uh, climate change global climate change very high rate and uh, there is the big issue of the water in the southern region of the country and uh, uh, this mechanism of the offset offsetting on the biodiversity we think uh, that uh, from our side from the minister environment is the good mechanism to allocate some uh, funds, not from the public, but from the private companies to spend on the uh, environmental uh, protection. So today here, I want to learn and uh, listen all your experience around the world. Thank you very much. So next, could I really ask you to speak up uh, also for the audience uh, we have in the room? We are going to try to find the mic, but uh, in the time being, for the time being, could you just... Okay. Uh, my name is Martin Harper. I'm the Conservation Director of the RSPB, so I'm not um, a government representative, so I'm a bit of an interloper, um, but I suppose I'm a representative of civil society on this panel. For those of you who do not know, the RSPB is about 125 years old. It has 1.1 million members. Uh, and we are the UK partner of BirdLife International. My experience um, over uh, conversating habitats of offsetting is mainly in the European context uh, where we have had a mitigation hierarchy in place with an obligation for compensation in place for the last two decades. And indeed, it was the RSPB that ran a legal challenge um, which obliged member states to compensate for damage to um, sites of European importance. So we do get involved in over a thousand planning cases a year where we are trying to actively ensure the mitigation hierarchy is properly applied. On the other side, we also manage and own quite a lot of land and we're quite experienced at restoring habitats. So we can turn carrot fields into internationally important wetlands in 12 years. Creating Caledonian pine forests and blanket bogs might take a bit longer, but we have some knowledge of what it takes to actually put biodiversity back. My take-home message for this session is to really highlight the importance of good strategic planning and good governance and, of course, stakeholder engagement, a subject which was featured by the Minister this morning, um, I think, quite rightly. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, before giving the floor to Vivian, uh, Yes, yeah, sorry, I'd just like to explain the audio situation in this room. We do not have a PA system here. The live streaming mic is picking up the audio fine for the, the audience watching at home, as it were. But for the inner table, your audience are the people behind you and the people in the back of the room who cannot hear you if you don't speak loud enough for them to hear. I'm sorry, we just don't have you mic. So please speak up. OK, good morning to everyone. My name is Vivian Paredes. I work for the government of Peru. Uh, specifically, I'm in charge of the unit for the evaluation of extractive and productive activities under this new agency called the Environmental Certification Agency, which is attached to the Ministry of Environment. It's a, a new agency just created uh, in 2012 and put into work uh, December last year. 
So we are going to be in charge of the approval or disapproval of the environmental impact assessments of big projects uh, of any sector, of any kind of activity. So we are trying to build up our capacities in order to better do this job, this important challenge. Uh, regarding offsets, on uh, February last year, we draw a draft, uh, regard, uh, draft law regarding these issues, still under public consultation. It was uh, made with the uh, help of the uh, Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, some NGOs. But uh, I think from what I've heard uh, yesterday and the experiences I want to, to share today, I think it can be improved. Uh, I think there are a lot of blank uh, uh, points that need to be filled uh, I think it's an important issue. I think the experiences uh, that I would like to hear from today will help for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michael, can I ask you? Uh, my name is Michael Crow. Um, I'm currently an independent consultant, but I did work for the state of Victoria down in Australia for, um, well, let's just say for a lifetime, but uh, <laughs> for quite a while. Um, uh, Victoria has a, a, a regulated biodiversity offsetting system. It operates on um, a larger number of small projects, if you like, rather than a smaller number of big projects. So it's, it's uh, rather than sort of a few big projects each year, it, it's uh, uh, dozens of projects coming through the planning system um, each year. Uh, in terms of... Um, my own experience in that, I was involved in the uh, establishment of the, the, the main policies and standards around that scheme back in the early 2000s, and uh, I was also responsible for the design and establishment of our credit market, which facilitates the supply of, of offsets through that system. Uh, with regard to a take-home message, um, I mean, I believe that uh, no net loss biodiversity offsetting is a, a critical part of the, the overall armory of, of, cons of biodiversity conservation. Um, I believe for that to operate effectively, it, it does need uh, a regulatory base. So, um, and beyond that, I think um, there needs to be clear policy and standards so that certainty is created for the participants in such a system. So um, uh, I guess I would sort of see that that's a very critical role for government is establishing that, that basic framework for, for no net loss biodiversity offsetting. Thank you. Okay, Michael, thank you very much. Preston, and please remember um, to My name is out. Preston Hardison. I work for the Tulalip Tribes of Washington. I guess I'm here actually as a government representative <laughs> since in the United States context, tribes are sovereign governments. Um, I have worked at the Convention on Biological Diversity since, um, well, since the prep comms, but I attended my first meeting in 96 and uh, uh, helped negotiate the uh, Nagoya Protocol on access and benefit sharing. I'm involved in the world intellectual property right negotiations on genetic resources, traditional knowledge, and folklore or traditional cultural expressions. Um, I'm interested in biodiversity issues and offsets. Um, of course, our focus is on free prior and informed consent and on the mitigation hierarchy. We believe that some of the criticisms of biodiversity offsets are, are actually more specifically associated with problems in the mitigation hierarchy. They're decisions that should be taken care of and uh, fixed during that phase of a process, and, and they shouldn't be showing up in an in a offset per se. Um, but we do need to, the bottom line message is we need to work on that, that aspect. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about free prior and informed consent and the status of indigenous peoples. And um, we need to make sure that the social participation, consultative, uh, participatory mechanisms are all in place in, in developing offsets and make sure those safeguards are there and that they're not just there on paper but effective on the ground. Mm. Thank you very much. 
Good morning. My name is uh, Tom Okuruta. I'm from Uganda. I work as uh, Executive Secretary for the National Environment Management Authority. It's a government agency responsible for re regulating our environmental mm -hmm. affairs in the country. Um, well, in the Uganda, the, the aspect of offsets in general are provided in the law, the government law, the Constitution and the National Environment Act. However, the, the compensatory mechanism that is there in the law is not really for biodiversity per se. It is intended for the communities and the human beings that get displaced as a result of development activities. We have uh, had some uh, provisions in the law, for instance, we urban forests in Uganda, there are quite, quite a number of them, where there is now craved by the urban authorities to, to do uh, offset of these forests uh, elsewhere. Now, of course, we've, not, we've had one example done, but the offset was not well taken care of because uh, the equivalent compensatory arrangement didn't work out well. So we are moving on very carefully on the next compensatory arrangements that are there by now looking at the biodiversity aspects as, a, as part of the, 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 the process or part of the condition to consider. So we have a challenge because really the detailed data of biodiversity in the areas where we need to move is not known. So we have had actually been using functionality. Uh, that's what we are recommending, using a functionality uh, approach, really, rather than the species approach for deciding on these uh, offsets. Uh, in, the, in the three areas of offsets that are now forthcoming, we have oil in Uganda, it's been discovered. Uh, first, 1930s, and then the colonial government then decided not to announce it. But in the 1990s, we came back with oil. But the oil is in the national park, actually, in the national parks of Uganda. So it has been a debate, and uh, sometime uh, 19, the nine, really nine, early 90s, the government decided that uh, we should go for the oil. But at, uh, OK, we want both, because national parks also bring a lot of revenue to the country. So the decision has been that we need to have the tourism going on, the biodiversity they are sustained, and the oil also. And uh, our, my institution's work is to try to see how the two, three competing things can take place at the same time. So the aspect of offsets and the discussion here has been very useful to me and my team who have come here. And uh, we think it will be very interesting to see how we are going to get this oil with the biodiversity there and with the people around there. And one other thing that I wanted to find out, which has been discussed yesterday and today, is in the case of offsets, how far should the offsite site be from where you are doing the compensation? Because uh, uh, in the earlier case, the, the national forest, which was supposed to be removed, was supposed to be offset 400 kilometers away from the site. I, I think uh, that's not proper because the conditions are changing and the biodiversity and this is also a change. So I would like to learn this from here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. As you can hear, we're safe. We found a mic. So uh, we'll go around the table for your convenience. Brian. Thanks. Uh, I'm Brother Diaz, uh, the Executive Secretary uh, of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And as you know, the the CBD is one of the UN um, uh, bilateral uh, agreements, and uh, it's basically a forum to uh, uh, promote a global agenda on biodiversity and help countries to really uh, do better in terms of governance over their uh, uh, biological uh, uh, resources and ecosystem services, and also traditional knowledge associated <coughs> genetic resources and all that agenda. We have some uh, ongoing uh, discussion for many years on issues like impact assessment. We have uh, already uh, uh, adopted voluntary guidelines for incorporating different aspects of biodiversity to uh, impact assessment uh, uh, linked to environmental licensing. Uh, the last one, I think, was at COP8. Uh, then more recently at COP10, we adopted also uh, guidelines for coastal and marine. Assessment. But 
but uh, it's an ongoing issue and we continue to do that. Um, we also have a discussion on uh, uh, how best to, uh, to engage the business sector, to uh, 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 engage them in a process to really incorporate biodiversity into their policies and into their practice, to change their business as usual to more sustainable practice. So it's a, a forum which offers an opportunity to build uh, consensus and move the agenda forward. So the issue of uh, um, offsetting has been uh, uh, discussed in uh, uh, recent uh, COPs, uh, but there's no uh, 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 formal decision yet uh, uh, to really uh, provide uh, 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 more uh, uh, government, uh, government uh, decision in terms of uh, the rules of the game in terms of standards, etc. But that can be done. So the CBD should be looked at as one uh, forum where these things can uh, be decided at the global level, bringing, building on the experience in different countries and, and regions. And the next COP in Korea this October, mm -hmm. we will be reviewing progress made in implementing all, all the 20 Aichi targets and implementing the global the Global Strategic Plan for Biodiversity and the National Revised uh, uh, Strategies for Biodiversity and Action Plans. And uh, we will be issuing a, a, the fourth uh, Global Biodiversity Outlook Report, which will be telling all of us that yes, we're making uh, progress here and there in implementing the IG targets, but if we continue in, in the current pace, we're not going to meet the 20 IEG target by the end of the, the decade. So an important discussion that will take place uh, at the next COP in Korea will be to for countries to uh, discuss and agree on what uh, uh, additional efforts needs to be done to really uh, increase the chance of achieving the IEG targets. And that could include uh, 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 discussions related to offsetting to the whole uh, 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 mitigation hierarchy in, in licensing, etc. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kai Duke. Uh, previously, I was at the European Commission as a, as a uh, administrator uh, leading biodiversity policy and was responsible for bringing the, the paradigm of natural capital ecosystem services into European policy um, and in uh, helping to kick off the T study, which was partly financed by the European Commission. Um, since leaving the Commission, uh, I've uh, been engaged uh, both in the independent consultant and with the company the Environment Bank Limited here in the UK. Uh, the Environment Bank is at the forefront of the emerging uh, offsetting market here in the UK. Um, we act as a broker between uh, the developers on the demand side and uh, landowners uh, on the supply side. Um, and uh, as an independent consultant, I've, I've been involved in a number of studies helping the UK government uh, get its head around offsetting, uh, particularly leading research work for a task force that was set up by government, a business-led task force called the Ecosystem Markets Task Force, uh, which was tasked to identify the main opportunities for UK business linked to protecting and valuing uh, the natural environment. And one of the top 20 opportunities that came out of that task force's work was biodiversity offsetting. Um, and the task force uh, identified a potential 500 million sterling a year market in England alone. Uh, so a, a, a significant opportunity for investment in UK nature. Um, uh, I've also worked uh, more recently with, with Kerry, in fact, on looking at lessons learned from the US and Australia. Um, it's a study that has not yet been published by DEFRA, um, but they're <coughs> using in relation to their own thinking on how to take forward offsetting in the UK. And that study focused uh, very much on the costs and benefits to developers, which of course is a key issue for any government wanting to take forward offsetting, um, but also at how you design the market uh, in, uh, to, and how that affects prices of offsetting. Um, uh, so again, uh, a key issue for government. Um, but we also looked at conservation outcomes uh, in relation to how you design the market, and we looked at broader economic benefits uh, to society. So that study, I hope, uh, will be published shortly uh, by, by the British government. Thank you. 
Um, uh, for uh, I think everybody knows Gary Gary Sorry. Yes, you can. I just wanted to clarify that um, I wear three different hats, and I think people are probably familiar with one, which is the bebop hat. But um, also, as you know, I work for Forest Trends, and we have um, some related work. Uh, including some work to support various governments in the evaluation of policy options for no net loss. And in that context, Guy just mentioned we've been doing some work for DEFRA, but just looking at colleagues around the table here, we've also worked in Uganda, Mongolia, Peru, and Canada um, through our teams. So that's a little bit different from the sort of international multi stakeholder work. I just wanted to point that out. Yes, my name is uh, Ray Victorine um, from Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, I also serve as the, uh, the Secretary of BBOM, and along with, um, actually with Carrie and Forest Trends, we have been working in these various countries that uh, uh, Carrie mentioned. We're also looking at new initiatives coming up to explore uh, the development of different policy initiatives in various countries in Africa, and hopefully develop some some good tools and uh, cross-cutting information that we'll be able to share as we move forward on some of these policies. So having these discussions with everyone uh, is very useful. Uh, in fact, I've just been in Uganda where we're also looking at some of these issues uh, related to uh, company commitments to uh, net positive impact and how those commitments might square with the, with the policies that are under consideration in Uganda. So I think these discussions will be quite fruitful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so let's dig into the discussion uh, now. And uh, we've heard uh, this morning about the importance of uh, strategic planning and, uh, and good governance. Uh, I think that's, uh, that would be a nice theme to start with. Um, we've heard uh, the, the minister uh, tell us about the cross-government approach that is taken in Gabon to develop this uh, sustainable development uh, plan, which is, I think, a very exciting idea. Um, but you also mentioned the, the struggle uh, between ministries and between different interests within government. Um, so I, I think um, that's an interesting topic to, to discuss, also from the Ugandan uh, experience. How is coordination um, being established and how does that function um, so that's uh, a, a theme for the panel and could I ask uh, Tom to kick off on that or would you want to tell us what the Ugandan experience is um, um, in Uganda we <coughs> we in respect to diversity we already have a national biodiversity action plan which is in line with the, the CBT requirements. And uh, as I said, the, the current law gives a general cover, but more specific on the, on the, on the biodiversity offset as, this, as discussed here. However, we've been going through our legislative review uh, process, which is in advanced stages, which has also involved also the private sector and civil society and discussion on the issue of uh, offsets. Of course, there are views that have been expressed by different people. Uh, one extreme view says uh, this is a buy by rich companies from the West. They want to come in and buy us and buy us out and then establish the, the system. I mean, replace it with whatever they want. But uh, all the same, that information has gone to the legislative review that we are undergoing. And uh, in the legislative review, we are trying to provide specifically first for uh, promoting the investment. That's the government that we need to promote its investment in all, the whole country. But uh, we, at the national level, that means at the national level, pl at the planning level, we need to promote it. But now this is performed by uh, information on biodiversity and identify probably areas where uh, offsets can be allowed uh, without much ado. We have a case, uh, maybe in our experience, uh, we have a Kalagala offsets. Kalagala offsets are 
is uh, really the only recognized offices in the country because when we are building a second dam, uh, the valley dam, uh, on the river line there are many falls. The Kalagala, the Bijagali, and the Simba, and also the famous Maxion Falls. And uh, there was an argument. And in order to build Bulat Bujagali, we had to offset Bujagali with what you call Kalagala. That means that the government agreed not to build a dam in the next falls so that the benefits from Bujagali are realized from Kalagala, especially the rafters. And I think by the last device, as I said. Uh, but now, uh, we have decided to build a dam below the Kalagala Falls. Now, the design of the dam can easily affect the flooding behind the back flooding. How much does the, the river come back? Does it reach the Kalagala Falls? The government uh, is interested in, or made a proposal to generate about 400 megawatts. And to generate 400 megawatts, it will compromise the other offset. So we're trying to work out the appropriate level where uh, the, the dams were going to get less power in order to sustain the Galagala offset. So, but in addition to this, really, under the matter of section plan, we're trying to populate our data, uh, for the information of the mass in terms of species level and so forth, so that we can enhance our argument on this. Thank you very much. Um, I'm coming uh, to this, uh, to you, Ray. But let me first ask uh, uh, Mr. Tunga Goya. You, you, in your introduction, you mentioned the coordinating role of your ministry. Uh, could you tell us a bit about uh, how that's done in practice and what your experiences are? <coughs> Thank you. Uh, to to do the offsetting in Mongolia, we are collaborating with the, uh, the Natural Conservancy. TNC to map the Mongolian all the region. Uh, actually, we separated Mongolia four regions, and we are uh, we are also doing actively uh, uh, like uh, uh, importance of the ecology or biodiversity on these regions. So that way, we can say that uh, in some certain places you can't operate any projects such as uh, mining or. Building roads of this uh, liner infrastructure. Some places you can, but you should offset or you should uh, to uh, protect the environment in uh, different places, such as uh, same conditions that uh, this project is called. So, uh, as uh, Tom, Mr. Tom said, that uh, within the ministry we have a fight, <laughs> of course. Because uh, uh, the Minister of Mining and Minister of Transportation, Minister of Energy, they all want to build. Of course, the people want to develop there. But from our side, we are saying, okay, this place you can, this place you can't. So this makes the companies and other ministries, uh, uh, it's, it makes clear that all the ministries and other players that, okay, they have this mapping, mapping so they have to plan in pure uh, starting their projects. So this mapping system would be the uh, base information for making decisions or making policy regulations there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That's, uh, uh, that's an important point to, to stress, uh, the, the need for, uh, for strategic planning and mapping. I, I, I take it, uh, Mr. Masson, that that's also the role of uh, what you mentioned, the national uh, land use plan in, in Gabon. What's, what was your experience in drafting that, uh, that plan in, in terms of coordination and collaboration with other ministries? The, uh, <coughs> the land plan uh, is still an ongoing process, uh, <coughs> but we are already beginning to uh, implement uh, some of its fundamental principle. Uh, I mentioned this uh, agricultural development uh, that uh, an agribusiness company uh, came to us with and, and we had to use uh, the principle of this land plan uh, to allocate land and to uh, ensure the involvement 
movement and the participation of local communities in the process. Now, uh, my ministry, uh, as I said, is basically the, uh, the guardian. Uh, decisions would have to come to a, a cabinet sectoral uh, uh, meeting where we, we, we would discuss you know, all the other ministry, agriculture and, and uh, budget, economy and so forth, uh, to lay down the arguments for going forward or not going forward. Uh, we, we're not yet uh, in a situation where we would uh, compensate. Uh, once a decision is, is, is made, it becomes a government decision and, and everybody backs, uh, adheres to the, to the, to the decision uh, and the government is ultimately responsible for, for that decision. Now, uh, it also applies when, when we have to decide when, when a private company wants to uh, do something in a protected area. If we make that decision, the government is basically responsible for that, uh, for that decision. Uh, I mentioned this uh, case where no company wants to uh, build a pipeline through a protected area. If we make that decision, it would basically be government's decision and we won't at this point expect any uh, compensation uh, of any sort uh, from, from that company. Uh, so that, that's, that's where we are and, and, uh, and that's the sort of coordination that we are uh, doing uh, at this point. But as I said, uh, we, we, we are very interested in really moving into uh, sort of offset framework uh, and that, and that uh, we, we will be interested in uh, working with uh, all the stakeholders and, and, and all of you in, in helping us uh, establish such, such a framework and, and all that it takes in terms of capacity building, regulation, regulatory uh, uh, texts and, 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 all, and all these prerequisites that, that we need to, to, to put in place. Uh, so that's, that's where we are at, at this point. Thank you very much. Um, Ray, um, you, you may want to um, uh, elaborate on this, also from the perspective of um, NGOs. How, how would an NGO um, encourage or um, governments to, uh, or help governments to establish uh, coordination? Thank you, Arthur. I think, well, NGOs, we have, you know, partnerships with lots of governments uh, and, uh, and have participated in part of multi-stakeholder processes, as, uh, as uh, Vivian mentioned in Peru, that has, that has gone on. Um, and also hope to create uh, uh, groups for decisions like task force that can work on these issues. I think what I was going to uh, actually pass the question on to Tom and, and maybe even get some input from, I know Joseph's here from, from uh, Petroleum uh, Exploration uh, Production Department. For example, um, we've had discussions with NAMRA in the past, we've organized different workshops and all, but how's that evolved in terms of, for example, uh, the decision making that's going on in, uh, in, in Uganda regarding oil? Because you have the NAMRA, which you lead in terms of your, uh, your role in, in, in regulation. You have Uganda Wildlife Authority, which manages the protected area and is in charge of the national park. And then you have groups like wetlands, which is in charge of the wetland areas around the Nile in that particular area. And then you have uh, uh, PPD, which is in charge of decisions related to oil. So I'm just curious on how uh, decision making is going on in terms of the stakeholder process, as the minister mentioned. And I wonder, and I know that we have been involved a bit with that with you and, uh, and other NGOs, but I'm just wondering how those decisions now are moving forward in Uganda and how do you see that, how do you see that working? So I'm going to pass the question on if I can. If I may, there's also a question from the audience, and maybe that's uh, can be addressed at the same time. So I'll ask this later. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Laura Conzo, International Finance Corporation of the World Bank, and I have a question for uh, Minister Masson and a representative from uh, Uganda and also Mongolia. Um, IFC has 
projects in all three of your countries. Um, we recognize the importance you know, of, of, of countries all over the world um, to have the opportunity for economic development and um, for poverty alleviation and for job generation. Most of the projects in which we work with, the local communities are on the ground, are not particularly asking questions about natural resources. Um, they're asking questions about jobs. They want the jobs. They usually want the development nearby them and not far away from them so that they can make use of that development. Um, but all this is to say is one plea that we have for your respective governments to, to help us is that IFC works on a company-to-company um, -company basis. And what we can really use is some kind of push for um, yourselves to ask companies to try to find mechanisms to work together. When they're in similar landscapes, um, similar sectors, and when they're affecting the same types of biodiversity, um, a small movement such as just asking the companies to work together, to share their data, this can be an enormous help and actually nothing less than a game changer in biodiversity management and uh, landscape management. And for just one more comment, one more. And um, if, if there's questions on how do you coordinate your ministries to do that, then ask the World Bank. Because what the IFC and the World Bank is interested in, we're interested in working together. We're interested in our World Bank colleagues working with the public sector to find out how we can roll out development on the ground, and IFC will come in with um, working with the private sector. So we want to do this in a coordinated fashion, and we'd like to help, but we do need that request from coming inside your government. Thank you very much. That's a very uh, passionate and uh, uh, specific uh, request. Uh, I'll ask uh, Mr. Masson to react and then uh, pass the microphone to Mr. Akut and uh, uh, Mr. Tonga. Just a very brief comments on, on this nexus, jobs, local development uh, and companies working together. In the area of uh, uh, the timber industry in Gabon, We've come up with uh, a regulation that essentially uh, oblige companies to uh, take into account the needs of uh, local development, but also the need for preservation. Uh, doing what? Through a charter that, that all companies essentially should uh, implement uh, that charter basically requires companies uh, to do things for local communities uh, but also to manage their estates in a sustainable way. Uh, this is by the law. And my administration has a responsibility to ensure that companies actually do it. Uh, and we still have capacity problems in, in enforcement, but, but that is what my ministry is responsible for uh, doing with these companies. Uh, they, they do come together, uh, they do come to me in, in evaluating where they are, what are the problems that, that they face. Uh, they have, some of them have put themselves in, uh, in, in companies, associations, and, and, uh, and groups. So I, you know, I, I, I take your, your offer and, and we'll certainly uh, come back to you and see how we could strengthen and, and, and reinforce things. Thank you very much. Mr. Okun, would you like to react and also uh, try uh, to answer the question from Ray? Thank you. Um, I think I'll start with the question from Ray. Um, in Uganda, the, the oil
say in, uh, in Uganda, uh, the oil, uh, the extraction of the oil, the process of extraction is organized under three uh, pillars. We have the resource pillar, which is under the Ministry of Energy. Uh, those are the guys who deal with the resource issues. Uh, then the Ministry of Finance and Associated Ministries deal with aspect of uh, finance and economic aspect. Now, the, the aspect of environment, which is the central part of our discussion here, is coordinated by my, my institution. That means that all, even the civil society, the government agencies and uh, institutions and departments of government that are working under there are different separate ministry mandates that are involved in the oil and gas are working within that pillar, which is coordinated by, uh, by us, or actually specifically, I ensure that the, the activities that are undertaken by these uh, different sectors are all shared. We have regular meetings and all these arrangements, also regular activities that we know what takes place by which, which, which group. Now, the input from the civil society under the various discussions, of course, the issue the civil society have raised more is dealing with the compensation of the communities that may be displaced by where the refinery is going to be built. Another, and okay, during maybe seismic surveys, um, the, the issue has been the adequacy of the amount of compensation that is involved. But uh, uh, the government has a process, each of the local governments has a compensation rate. But on the environment issues, we are really, I think, working together. We, uh, we, as, as for instance, never we know what the Uganda Weather Authority is supposed to do, and they give us that information. The guys are fisheries, the guys doing the water, the guys doing forestry, and as indicated, uh, the oil is in the, in the entire battery. So various people are involved. Now the local governments uh, bordering the, 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 the oil area are also part and parcel to this working arrangement. So we uptake the information through this pillar arrangement. That's how we get this information and feed uh, to the mainstream. At also high level, there's an interministerial committee, which now brings in the, the three pillars together. Uh, the economic pillar, the resource pillar, the environment pillar, are now brought together at the interministerial level. And that's, that's how uh, it's arranged. So far, it's been working well. And uh, the coordination, uh, of course, requires the government has put in resources for that coordination in our organization to ensure that the environment aspect. Actually, the, most of the issues of concern of the public are of the environment, not the economic. They, they're not bothered about that. They're bothered about the environment because that environment is where they get fish, because the legal part is part of it. That environment is where they get the forest, the trees, then the wildlife, the, the business associated with it. Now, for the IFC, um, uh, yeah, there are some IFC projects that are, that are in the country. Uh, how we want to link the IFC activities to the communities is through the certification process for these projects that they undertake. And again, this is done in our, in our my organization. And in that process, we have put some conditions for sharing of information uh, by the different uh, developers. Uh, and if that information is shared, uh, because some companies are shy to give it out, but the study reports come to us and they become public documents and they, they can be accessed from there as soon as we have gone through and approved it. So uh, we have a system to, to connect that. And if there's any specific case, we can probably discuss and see how we can help it. Thank you very much. Let's, let's ask uh, Vivian from Peru to uh, respond to this, uh, this discussion and uh, maybe also a brief from the IFC. Thank you very much. Well, um, yeah, cross-border coordination is definitely a challenge, uh, specifically when you're trying to do some conservation of uh, biodiversity and others are trying to explore it without taking care of it. But the institution I'm working on is actually a very sui generis. The highest um, decision maker is a council where ministers from environment, economics, agriculture, construction, production, health, mining, and energy participate. 
So they're the ones that are going to take decisions on policies that my institution are going to take. So under this council, the big decisions are going to be, sorry, are going to be taken. And it's going to be hard, difficult, even it, it took one year for them to decide who's, who was going to be the chief of the institution. So, but the good thing is that once they take a decision, it's going to be by all of them. Like, there's not going to be a step backwards or contradictions between them. So, that's, that's, that's I think, uh, that could be seen as a problem, but I think it's an advantage that all of them participate in this council. And another thing, that this institution is, maybe without it, I'm close to the mic and I think I, I can yes. speak a little bit louder. Could you be brief uh, uh, on this point? Then? Sure. Because I, I do have some other questions that I, I need to address. Excellent. Uh, I was going to point out that this, this institution is created not only to because the need that all these environmental impact assessments were before evaluated by different sectors, and now it's only going to be centralized by one, but also because uh, for an investor, it was very hard to get the environmental license because he had to deal with different entities. So we're going to create this one window um, evaluation uh, process uh, thing, like the investor is going just to go through this one entity and get all the permits regarding uh, deforestation or uh, water use or anything through, through our one window system. So this system, our plan is to be like uh, a software that coordinates with all entities at national and regional level. So I think it's going to be a, a, a good um, a good mechanism for cross-sectorial coordination. Um, and I just finally to point out that the, with this system we also, and that's a very important key issue for offsets, we're going to systemize baseline information because nowadays for each project they make their own baseline and that's information that gets lost. So with this system we're going to have like uh, an open system for also investors to take that information for their best land, but also that will help us for monitoring and for evaluating. So that's, that's a good thing because that's information that the, the, the private sector is paying for. And nowadays, for example, we're trying to do a forest inventory. Maybe, you know, we could have had already a bit of the homework made if we had this information systematized before. But well, that's the thing we're going to work on. And also we're working on, on, on zoning on for, for, yes. Could, could, I, could I just stop you here on this sure, point? Sure, sure, no problem. Please make them, but um, I think you, you make a point of the importance of this. Sure. Do you have other points that you want to raise? No, maybe with other questions I can finish. Okay. Good, because I, I, I do need to uh, move on. I'm sorry to, to push the panel. I, I will ask you to be, to be very brief, but I do need to hear from Preston and Michael and, and, and Martin. Um, and then Brownie, I wanted to say something about um, the IFC, I guess. So I'll, I'll pass the mic to Brownie, and then I propose we move on to uh, uh, another team on, um, on, on governments, uh, governance and uh, maybe also the involvement of stakeholders. Thanks. No, I just wanted to build on uh, the point raised by IFC on the need for more landscape uh, planning. So uh, usually uh, 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 environmental licensing is based on project by project approach. And experience all over the world proves that this is not uh, sufficient, it's not adequate. So we really need uh, a, a regional and large scale uh, planning. And the earlier we can incorporate environmental issues in the planning, the better. Because uh, if you just uh, uh, raise the environmental concerns at the end of the process, when everything is already uh, almost uh, finalized, it's too late. So uh, uh, by uh, 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 
making uh, 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 strategic environmental assessment uh, a requirement in the countries would, uh, uh, I think, help a lot in uh, uh, requiring that uh, more coordinated planning at the landscape and then bringing all the different uh, uh, players and different projects to work together. Thanks. Okay. Um, John, could you tell us a bit about your experience in Canada? Um, uh, how the federal government uh, involves um, regional government and maybe also local government? Sure. So, Canada is, uh, has a very different uh, setup than most other countries, although we're very close to Australia in the sense that um, most of the responsibility for land use planning is uh, held at the provincial level. Um, whereas the federal government is involved in land use planning only where we actually own or control lands, which is a very limited part of the country, or through specific issues. So when an, is when an activity impacts an aquatic species, the federal government has the right to preserve the habitat of the, the, the fish or the aquatic species. And more recent, and that's a long-standing law uh, with well-established rules, including over 20 years of very well-developed experiments with um, aquatic habitat offsets. More recently, the federal government also asserted authority over species at risk. And um, this is an area that is creating considerable federal provincial tension. So the, the basic premise is that when we identify and list a species at risk, the federal government then um, can take authority uh, to protect the habitat of that species, even if that habitat is provincial land or private land. To, to the, this law is 10 years old. To date, we have not done this, other than for aquatic species, where, as I say, we have a long uh, um, legislative authority and well understood federal provincial relations. <coughs> so um, that's, the, that's sort of the, sort of the legal landscape. <coughs> um, as I say, we have very limited experience in integrating this issue-specific lens that the federal government has with the provincial, the province's ongoing responsibility over land use. And the challenge that we have, uh, of course, is to result, is to produce a coherent result uh, through what is fundamentally a political process. And all I can say at the moment is it's an ongoing evolution. Um, if we get, if, if there's time, there's another very interesting issue in Canada that is emerging, and that is the relationship between the federal government and Aboriginal people who also have um, significant authority and interest in land use and, uh, and maybe of interest to folks. Yes, thank you very much. That's definitely a theme that I want to uh, touch upon. Uh, uh, actually, I propose that we finish with that one. Uh, but before we do, uh, uh, let me check whether, uh, uh, how many people f in, the, in the audience are from business? I know some, but, ah, uh, good, good. So, um, anybody uh, with specific requests or burning issues to be raised um, for, for these government people here on the, around the table? I, I see Stuart and I see the lady in the back. Stuart, please. Thanks, Arthur. Um, I'm uh, Stuart Anstey. I'm actually now an independent consultant, but uh, just until recently I had 20 years of experience in the biodiversity area within Rio Tinto, uh, a mining company. So I'm just interested in the viewpoints of the um, government representatives in terms of what you're looking at and what you're potentially doing to incentivise um, very sound and high level social and environmental performance um, within the private sector companies that are bidding for projects within the countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, Alice, could you pass the mic to uh, 
Alice, please, and for a brief question. Brief question, Alice, and we'll try to get brief answers. Okay. Uh, Alice, remember UNDP? Um, I'm just struck by the um, question from Uganda, and not only because I'm from there, but also, <laughs> but also because I think, I think that we've had a long discussion yesterday and today, uh, looking at how different organizations are, are managing to do this. But here is a question from Uganda where they are actually struggling. And they're talking about the fact that the, the investment will take place. It has to take place. There is no saying that uh, you can't do this or you can't, you can't process there. So how, for me, my issue is how do we help a country like Uganda and others in Africa, which are going through the same situation, where the investments will still take place, and therefore help them find a balance on how they can keep their tourism, they can keep their people's interest, but they can also develop oil or provide energy where it's needed. I would, I would like to hear us discuss more practical ways of supporting a country like that. Thank you. Okay. Who in the panel would want to take this off? <coughs> Mr. Tuga? Ah, uh, it's good. Hmm? It's good. Okay. Mr. About the issue of incentives uh, to companies, I, really, I, I think the first thing is clarity on uh, regulations. That, that's, that's essential. Uh, what often happens, and what I've seen uh, upon taking office, is that you may have uh, cross cutting. Regulations or all regulations that were not reformed and uh, are still being implemented, and new ones and so forth. So, regulatory clarity is, is, is essential on, on, on these issues. Uh, you know, simple, clear regulations. Uh, second thing is uh, I think is, it's important that, that uh, uh, governments and, and the private sector and companies uh, engage. Uh, on, on these very difficult issues and, and, and come up with uh, common grounds uh, on, on how to work together uh, so that companies understand that if, if they do not abide by, by the rules, there's, there's going to be consequences and that uh, eventually uh, there's, there's no way out. Uh, and that government do their best uh, not to really uh, uh, continue creating uh, uncertainty for companies, but, but to set the rules in, in, a, in a clear fashion. Uh, and I think the third thing is, once the country has uh, an overall plan, which I think in the case of Gabon we do, and ensure that companies understand where the country wants to go and what it means in terms of uh, protecting the environment, protecting biodiversity, uh, and where everybody should, should be committed to. And I think with these, uh, it should be possible to, uh, to, to uh, encourage companies and, 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 uh, and help companies uh, play, play by the rules and, and, and join in the game. So, Thank you very much. Um, could I, yes, um, Martin, on, on this theme, and then I'll uh, I suggest we move on to the next uh, uh, issue. Um, I'm, I'm acutely aware that the context of the debate about biodiversity offsets are incredibly different, and so I shall try and uh, respect uh, Kerry's suggestion at the beginning of the conference yesterday to be very humble about my remarks, because I'm coming from a European experience. But if there was a UK government uh, representative here today, they would be able to explain how they responded to the challenge um, by our own Chancellor uh, that applying a mitigation hierarchy through European law was placing a ridiculous cost on business. And they then that triggered a review on the implementation of the European law in England, uh, which has the mitigation hierarchy in place, and actually what they found was it was occasionally the lack of implementation of the law that created the problems. Mm -hmm. The lack of adequate evidence, the lack of 
um, certainty for developers, and therefore the obligation was back on the government to help improve the regulatory standards. And just while I'm here, I, I, I feel that although there are some things which are very different about our country circumstances, um, obviously the amount of natural habitat particular countries have, there are some remarkably similar things. So even in England at the moment, there is a debate to try and extract oil from within protected areas. Uh, and we have similar debates now about how do you involve civil society concerns in these debates. And my challenge, I suppose, to anyone in this debate is to think about what is your hierarchy of importance and then what are your tests by which you want to uh, ensure that your most important areas are protected and then to build your legislative and compensatory habitat uh, mechanism in, in, in line to try and ensure that your most important things are protected and you have a clear test for developers to pass if they are going to have their development go ahead. And I would always argue that we should be looking for compensation for any damage. Thank you very much. Um, speaking of the involvement of uh, uh, NGOs and civil society, um, uh, maybe this is a good moment to um, discuss what has been suggested by John as well, the role of uh, indigenous peoples and how uh, governments involve uh, indigenous peoples and local communities. And I'll ask Preston to uh, kick off on that. Sir, we can get the, uh, the presentation up. I, I have a little PowerPoint, and don't be afraid, it's not a lot of text, it's a couple of cartoons. But I thought they were important, they were up there. Um, so, there are several issues that need to be dealt with concerning indigenous peoples. The first thing I would note is that remember, indigenous peoples, indigenous peoples are place-based. They're from a region, and, and of course, well, let me back up. I want to talk about my premises. I do not presuppose what in any indigenous peoples or local community wants. It's their business and their choice of what they want. There's no denying that for many indigenous peoples and local communities, jobs are important, economies are important, education is important. They look for these things, and the IFC was right that they look for these things. But they are also place-based. They come from cultures often that have many thousands of generations behind them, and they have beliefs that are embedded in a landscape, a very particular landscape. So sometimes you have to actually think what is compensatable and what is not compensatable. The peoples I work for have ancestors that live in the landscape, and the spirits are there and alive and living, and they talk to them, and they um, are important for helping them through their lives. To displace them from that landscape is a really big problem for them because it's not simply about I'll go over there and get my living over there and my livelihood there. It's because they can't really replace their whole identity, their human dignity, their well-being, their physical, mental, spiritual well-being are all tied to that particular piece of land. So that's that's something to realize in the background you really have to think about. Now, on this, just briefly on this issue of functionality. It's true, we're facing a situation in the world where, where we're having some difficulties in, difficulty in the issue of, of species composition. what our ecologists are now calling no novel ecosystems emerging, things are changing. So a purely species-based approach is sometimes a very big problem. We understand that. On the other hand, indigenous peoples are tied often to particular species. There are totem species. I work for a salmon people. So much of their identity is involved in the salmon. And they're totem animals for that. those people. So we will have to kind of find a balance between those sorts of issues. Now, if we can go um, to the next slide. I think we've actually heard this here. We need clarity and process from the mitigation hierarchy to offsets. So many of you may remember this. It shows two scientists doing it. One's doing an equation, and the second scientist says, well, I think I found your problem here. You're not quite explicit in this second step. 
And I think we have to get really explicit in all of the steps. Um, in the mitigation hierarchy, when we talk about, for example, the no-go, go decisions, one of the emerging criteria through the um, IFC, for example, in the performance standards, Actually, aren't just something on paper and also on the ground. Okay, the next next uh, slide. <clears throat> and the other one is to start to listen. This is why participation is so important. Now, I'm actually this is this is the position can be reversed. This doesn't. Uh, it could be indigenous peoples talking to the dog. It could be business people <coughs> talking to indigenous peoples. It could be governments talking to business. We have a problem in conversation all the way around, and it, it has some guy telling his dog, now I tell you, Ginger, stay out of the garbage, stay out of the garbage, and all Ginger hears is blah, 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 Ginger. We don't always understand the terms that we're using. We use the same terms, we may mean different things. So for example, we've, we've run into this in the CBD, we use the word protection. Protection against what? Do we want protection of our livelihoods? Do we want protection of our, our particular landscapes, of sacred sites, of our values? There are many things that we might want protected, and, and that one word can actually hide a lot of variation. So in dealing with offsets, I think we have to get very clear and get mutual understanding. We really have to build that mutual understanding. Uh, and then there is one third little slide. And I think we, Braulio brought this up on this, you know, when we started on the biodiversity offsets, of course we were just doing projects and we we're testing how this might even work. And so you're, you're thinking of biodiversity offsets as a patch. Well, the value of an offset is going to be dependent on where it sits in the landscape and where it sits to other patches of biodiversity. It's, and, and so what's the offset going to do? Is it going to be part of a network? Is it going to be part of a corridor? Is it going to be part, you know, how is it situated in the landscape? And the value will vary. In terms of the decision making of indigenous peoples, remember, they're not just making some decision about this project. They're making their decision in the whole context of their identity and their livelihoods and their human rights. So, you know, they're having major problems with habitat loss, climate change, and again, people don't realize climate change is moving species around on landscapes. From a biodiversity point of view, an offset is where you take a, uh, an impact at one place and you, you mitigate it and compensate at another place. Well, what's happened is indigenous peoples have been sedentarized. They're now, their legal boundaries are often tied to a particular geographic area and their legal rights are circumscribed. When those species move out of that area, they can't pursue them. They no longer have the rights. It's like you're taking the green rug and pulling it out mm. from under them. And so they're fa on top of the, the other kinds of impacts they're suffering, they're also nature is on the move, and we're really struggling on how we're going to deal with that. So the bottom line is you need to take all of these things into account, and they really should, as I said in my preference, they should be taken care of in the first Tranche. Now, one last very quick point. We know in the world situation, indigenous peoples have a kind of unique place, and that's under debate. The United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was passed in, 19, in 2007, and we know it's an aspirational document, but a very large number of countries have signed it, and they, they agreed with the aspirational document. Maybe not every part, but the aspirations. Indigenous peoples have some unique forms of governance, and depending on the state that you're in, like in Canada, like in the United States, like in New Zealand, there are sometimes constitutional level provisions that recognize they're not merely stakeholders. And that actually is the, the essence of prior informed consent. It's saying they're not simply, you know, normally a government gets used to making decisions on behalf of its citizens and it balances different stakeholder groups and rights and interests. But indigenous peoples in many cases have a unique status where even at a constitutional level, it says they have rights that cannot be taken away <coughs> from them and decisions that cannot be made for them. And that's the essence of prior informed consent. So that's... 
Thank you very much, Bretton. Um, does somebody in the audience want to uh, respond to that or, or propose experiences? Somebody from the panel. Uh, sorry, um, Mr. Ledeck. Just a quick point that often uh, when, uh, when I talk about biodiversity offsets and more broadly protected areas, indigenous peoples are often brought up as, as a constraint, but I think they're off, often uh, very valuable partners. There are so many places I've worked when I was working in Latin America in particular where the indigenous community wanted a protected area because it strengthened their ability to control what happens within their uh, identified territory and uh, reduces what they perceived as external threats. I think with new money coming into the system, whether it comes from biodiversity offsets or from RED, there are lots of opportunities to involve indigenous people with benefit sharing schemes. So, um, you know, there are always some people who sort of for ideological reasons <coughs> question any kind of uh, protected area scheme and wonder about the local communities, but I think very often they can and will be good partners in this process. Okay, thank you very much. Great. You know, I realize that uh, no one answered Alice's question. Thank you there. And uh, I'm just going to skip on the microphone, I think. Um, I think it's important, I think you heard some interesting things here. We talk, heard from Vivian that Senase has been created. It's a brand new institution. We heard from Uganda um, about the new challenges that are being faced in, in that country. We heard from Mr. Minister that um, Gabon is coming, developing new legislation. So the question really is that as part of this process, it's happened in Uganda, there was a multi-stakeholder process in Peru, but without the funding from the donors to provide that support, it's going to be very difficult. It's one thing for there to be lots of financing for projects, but what happens in terms of the capacity, where you need to build capacity in, within government to review EIAs, to be able to analyze whether or not this is a no-go or not a go area to develop those practical skills. And we need to have really donors to step up and say, this is really important. We're going to be financing projects, and so we need to build that foundation for better decision making and better practice. Because without that, I don't think we're going to be successful. Okay, thank you, Ray. Well, that raises some interest in the audience. Uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to handle that, but we are running out of time, and we have five more minutes. First, I'll take a question from the lady, uh, uh, in the back, and then I'll go to Pippa and others. But please be brief in your question, Mark. Sure, uh, Sandra Bell from France I just. I think it would be really important to, to hear from the panel in response. I think Preston has raised some really, really important fundamental issues. And um, I know this is an issue in, in other countries represented around the table as well. I know there's been uh, land rights uh, issues in Peru, for example, with uh, connected to, to carbon offset um, projects. Um, but even in a country like the UK, I think this is a really important point that people's access to nature uh, is not really considered in, in offset schemes. And so, um, at the same time, that there's more and more evidence that uh, it's really crucial to our well-being that we're actually regularly connected to nature and it's important for mental health, for children's development. And yet, our environment minister has said it's okay for an offset site to be provided an hour's drive away. Well, that's kind of like saying nature's theme park that you go and visit. It's not something that you're connected to on a a day-to-day -day basis, and I think the evidence, both from the UK and the Global South as well, is very much that if people are, the more connected people are to nature, the, the more they will care for and protect it. So it just would be a plea to come and to, to come go back to this issue of the time. Thank you very much. Um, an hour away in, in, in the Netherlands, and we would call it Germany. There's. Uh, there's Pippa, and then I'll pass the mic over to the left. 
Thanks, Alvin. Partly in response to Alice, but also ready to just to contribute into the, the question around collaboration and, and the multi, need for multi stakeholder um, groups. And I just wanted to reflect on a conversation that was had by some of the leading NGOs um, who came to Cambridge on the back of a, an extractive industries uh, sort of think tank with WWF set up um, about a month or six weeks ago. And it was the recognition that there are minerals landscapes, there are, are mineral provinces, um, and that very often you've got a number of companies extracting or, or exploiting within common areas. And that by the same measure, many NGOs are operating in those same places. And we made a commitment um, to collaborate more, um, to actually utilize the various sort of accesses we have into uh, either into government or the support that co uh, the partnerships we have within companies to to actually try and facilitate a much easier process for multi-stakeholder uh, dialogues, but also um, solutions. So I just wanted to put that in the room. And this was um, shared with uh, the BBOP Advisory Committee um, a week ago, and also increased uh, collaboration with CSPI, ICMM, IPCA, all those memberships. So um, it's all looking good. Thank you. Um, Please. Yes, Kirsten Hans from the World Bank, just since we're in the donor business. <laughs> and, then just, and I think building upon Laurie's remark for collaboration, I think, yes, capacity building needs to be done, but it, this is also a plea in a, to collaboration within governments, because it's really difficult in the countries where I work and where a Ministry of Mines and a Ministry of Environment don't really share data. The Ministry of Mines will give out mining concessions without knowing where the protected areas are. A Ministry of Forestry that has their forestry concession. And then nobody really talks to each other. So you'll build capacity in one ministry um, on environmental issues and then and the Ministry of, well, they don't share, a Ministry of Environment will not share EIAs with the Ministry of Mines. So there's, it's very hard to do effective capacity building if within government there's not a clear vision and a collaboration within ministries. And it's not necessarily about very complicated land use plans. It's really about discussion and sharing existing data. And that is something we'd be very happy to help with. But if there's not a willingness from government and everybody sort of sits on their own little piece of the land, if you like, then that makes it very hard. So that's just, just a plea, I think, for, for anyone here to facilitate donor work. And then I think it, it will also be easier to do that kind of capacity building and make it more effective. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I see all kinds of hands, people waving at me. I will just wave back for, for now. <laughs> 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 um, I, I do uh, intend to take a few more questions, but uh, we should really wrap up in five minutes. Business business people are waiting for us. So it, should be, it should be an incentive. And I will, let, I will leave the last word uh, in this session for uh, for Braulio from CBD, that's, that's only one. So, I'll take your question, your question, and your question, but only they are brief. <coughs> okay. I, it's Simon, I'm an independent consultant. Ray, it's to you, it's just to say that um, it's not just the donors that can support capacity building. For example, um, in Liberia, a lot of the certain ministries were asking private sector so, for example, if they were coming in country to do an ESIA over a long period of time, whether they could succumb somebody onto the project to watch how it was uh, reviewed, how you undertake it. And I think that's incredibly valuable, actually, as well as you know, asking for roles outside. I think the private sector could, could play a role um, in supporting ministries as well. Thank you very much. The microphone could be passed to the lady in the back. Thank you very much. It's just a comment uh, to add to Kirsten's point. Um, basically, I think one step in terms of sharing data could be, you know, for, for countries to establish uh, a central mapping unit, where you actually, you know, have in one place on one mapping standards all the concessions mapped in a country from agriculture, forestry, mining, yes. uh, and whatever infrastructure plan are in place. I think first of all that would increase transparency, and secondly, would really enhance uh, collaboration and coordination. And one example that's happening as a result of Red Plus is in Indonesia on the one, one map. 
I, I think it's only in the beginning, but it's already showing some interesting outcomes. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think that's also been the experience in, in Peru, or in, in at least their ambition. Now, the lady, no, the, yes. Um, and that will be the last question or remark. I'm sorry for everybody, but um, we do need to, uh, to wrap up. Please. Thank you. Nicola Baumfeld from the Department for International Development. I think I have to kind of come in at this point as well from the Dover community. And I hope I can make the last question a good one. Um, it's more of a comment, really. Um, we're planning to do some work around mapping um, of kind of geological resources, but also trying to overlay some of the more sensitive receptors. And environment and communities are really the key um, key aspects that we want to kind of include in that. But I just wanted to say something. Coordination around that is absolutely essential because it feels like there's a, a new scramble for mapping. Um, I cover Africa as a, a whole region, so really interested to hear from people who are interested in that region. Um, but I think just an insight into the way that donors work. I think it's really important for governments to actually request in country the support that they need and really prioritise those requests because I'm pushing from headquarters in DFID for us to really prioritise this area around environment planning, responding to EIA, helping countries to develop strategic um, environmental assessments, land use planning, but our country offices are so very, very busy and they respond very much to government requests at a country level and you know how to manage finances, tax, transparency, trade, they tend to get a much higher priority at a country level. So I think it's really a request from all of us that if you know if that can really be pushed at a country level within government, then we will respond to it, but it has to come to us in that way because we very much are demand driven in country. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um Fabio, this is the final verdict. <laughs> Certainly not final uh, I want to address uh, the issue raised by President, but also the issue of raised on uh, oil exploitation in uh, Uganda. Um, of course, in the past, uh, uh, indigenous people would uh, adapt to climate change by migrating. They were nomads, right? But of course, now that's very difficult, right? Almost impossible in most cases. So we need to really look very uh, uh, carefully to that issue because that's a growing issue. And we're gonna have displaced people everywhere. So they're fixed in, in one place, but then their living conditions are not there anymore. So what, what, uh, what kind of response uh, uh, do we get? And also much of what we still have of nature is, is here thanks to indigenous and local communities. They have been the traditional uh, 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 guardians of, of, of these uh, uh, environments and we need to really work better w uh, with them. And then of course uh, many countries are finding opportunities to face their need to create new jobs and enhance the economy by exploring petrol, uh, uh, oil exploitation. And I'm sorry, that's the wrong answer. We're not going to uh, uh, move towards a more sustainable world if we keep uh, increase in exploitation and use of uh, fossil fuel. That's very clear. So we need, uh, we have more than, uh, it's a huge amount of money governments invest in subsidies for uh, 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 consumption of fossil fuel all over the world. It, and uh, 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 we had, uh, we heard question asking for incentives. Well, that's where the money needs to come from. We need to reform our incentives. Well, our economic instruments are subsidies. That's where the money is going to come from. So uh, uh, stop uh, uh, financing an unsustainable business and move, uh, shift that money to sustainable uh, 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 business. And uh, do that uh, in a way that we can help further conserve uh, uh, nature and also uh, uh, work together with the indigenous and local communities. And we need to find a way to be more flexible in terms of how we uh, uh, use the land, because we have to accommodate not only for the uh, in, uh, uh, challenge of indigenous people, but species. Species are moving. So eventually, our national parks will not be able to conserve anymore what they were meant to, to do. So we, we need uh, corridors, we need... Uh, 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 so, I don't have the answer, but it, it's, it's a challenge we, we have to face. Okay, thank you very much, and, and thank you to uh, the, our panelists, um, and thank you to the audience. I think we have had a, 
a rich discussion. Um, yes, please sit down on the floor.